Well, hello, everyone. Uh, first of all, thanks for inviting me here. I'm glad to see so many people on in the evening after work, willing to listen to something new. So the talk is going to be about OAuth 2, about the protocol itself and good things about it as well as bad things. I'm going to tell you when it fits, which use cases are, are good for OAuth. I'm also going to tell you why OAuth is not a protocol at all. So bad things about it as well. Oops. Uh, briefly about myself, I work as a software engineer in Ukraine. I also run the Java user group in Lviv and organize a conference which is JDA Lviv, conference for Java developers. We do run it every year in September and so if you're willing to visit Ukraine occasionally and listen about new things in, in Java world, then I highly, highly encourage you to, to join us, both as speakers and participants. And that's my Twitter, if someone wants to follow. Uh, yeah, so what's on the agenda? Why, first, why OAuth? Let me ask you a question. Uh, how many of you know what is OAuth? Like, okay, everyone. Good, basically everyone. So first I'm going to tell you what, what was the problem that led to the specification development. Then uh, We'll see what are the predecessors. I mean, how, how did people solve these problems before OAuth was in place? Uh, then we'll see what's inside the protocol specification, which is not a protocol, the RFC. Uh, then we will just briefly check what are the available implementations on the market. Uh, I'll show a short demo with Spring Framework, how, how you can put an OAuth authorization server in place by, by using Spring. I'll make some conclusions and then uh, answer your questions if there are any. So yeah, first, wh where it all started. Yeah, there is a database here. So in, in a simple use case, people were building applications which were deployed on a single server and they needed to authorize users. So there was a, an authentication layer put on top, in front of the application which did check the user request that normally contained credentials such as user and password. Those were validated against the database and if were those were valid, the user got access to the application. Simple as that. But like, nowadays, you are likely to be working on something like this. You're likely to, to have your API exposed to all sorts of clients such as mobile phones, server-side applications, and, and others. And th those applications may be built not only by by you, but by other vendors as well. So consider the case if, if this is an API, and this is built by you, and you want to expose that API to other people and to have them build applications on top of it. So, but still, your, your users have to, you, you own the user accounts. So you, your users have to authenticate to, to your API through all these, these appliances. Well, what are the possible solutions? You may say, let's, let's, then, let's just store user credentials on all these applications, on the server, on the mobile phone, and whatever there is. And then if the credentials are stored on, on these inside these applications, they can authenticate with the API and, and solve the problem. Well, this is insecure, of course, because if, if you store your credentials on every, every client of your API, they, they have to be stored in clear text which means if one of these clients is compromised, then all your user credentials are compromised. That, like, that's, that's part of the problem. Another thing is that if, if one client has access to user credentials, to the username and password, he has a broad access to your API. You cannot say that, for example, mobile client only has access to the user profile page, and the server client has access to some, some other APIs. Like, if, if they, they have the user, user name and password, they can do whatever the user can, can. Another problem is you cannot revoke access from a single client. For example, you, your, your, users, your user has lost a cell phone and he wants to revoke the access for that client. It's impossible. He has to change his username and pass his password. And if the password is changed, all the other clients are also losing the access to, to the API. So this problem appeared a long time ago, and in, at that point, 
major companies which were building their APIs started building their own solutions, which led to proprietary protocols being implemented by Google, by Yahoo, uh, Facebook, Twitter as well. So basically every, every company was solving the same problem in their own way. And if you had to build an application which integrated with all of these APIs, like consider an app which is integrating with Google Plus and, and Facebook and, and Yahoo and so on, you had to learn all the proprietary protocols and implement clients on top of them. So if, even if the clients were provided, this still increased the complexity of, of your code and gave you more chances to, to make errors. Because if you are implementing 10 clients instead of one, you have 10 more chances to make an error. With, with all these issues, OAuth 1.0 came into play. So this was a protocol which was supposed to solve the problem. Like, it was supposed to become an industry standard for building authentication for APIs and be an interoperable, widely deployed protocol. Uh, problem, yeah, what was wrong with the previous approach, then one new API required one new protocol. Then when OAuth 1.0 came in to market, it, it, didn't, it, was, it wasn't widely adopted. Although it was expected to happen, it didn't because the protocol was too complex. Like, because of two reasons. First, the development group that focused on, on that developed the protocol, they were focusing on security, and they missed one key point. Security must be simple. If it's complex, there are two problems. Users either will not implement it at all, or they will implement it badly, and bad implementations will lead to security holes. Why it was so difficult, there were a number of issues. One of them, yeah, the, 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 the dev group focusing on security. Another one is that they had to support PHP 4. This is a bizarre requirement if you think about it as a, you know, authentication protocol to be deployed across thousands of servers across the planet, and somebody decided to put PHP version 4 for their requirements. Yet they did it, but as a result, the OAuth 1.0 was not widely deployed, and that's how OAuth version 2 came into, into market. So they said, yeah, let's build a new protocol, which will be much easier to use than, uh, than the previous version, which will still be secure and will solve all our problems. Yet things did not go as planned. Why? Because at that point, many companies realized that this will be the next major thing. This will be deployed, on, deployed by all the API providers in the world if, if, if it becomes a standard. So this definitely provides a good opportunity to make money. Like if, if it is deployed on, on by, by multiple companies, you can definitely make money out of it, of consulting or by building your, your proprietary products. So many, many companies did join the development group, including Google, Yahoo, Facebook, and, and others. And they started pushing this back into, in a way that, that would suit them, that would help them to, to make money from it. So that's why it didn't go as planned. The spec development took forever. Like it was not finalized after three years of development. One, one reason why it became notorious is that Aaron Hammer, the original lead of the spec, left and he said such things. He said that OAuth 2 is the biggest disappointment of his entire career. He removed his name from the spec. He also said that it, it no longer looks like anything he wants to put his name on it. And think about it, this is a, the words of the man who led the development of this spec for years, the both versions. Anyway, OAuth 2 is on the market. So we, that, that's why we should care. Uh, all these, the, since, since the companies were pushing the, the specification development the way they, they wanted to, dev group had to make trade-offs. Like they had, they, signatures were removed from the protocol, so requests are no longer signed. Also, Aaron was pushing to, to get that part of the spec. It, it was removed. Other trade-offs were made as well. Some parts of the protocol are left unspecified. Like the protocol, oftentimes says, "This is this is beyond the scope of, of the document." And if you if you just search, if you open the the spec and search for the phrase, 
unspecified or beyond the scope of, of this protocol, then it appears like maybe 20 times or, or more on the 60 pages of the document. So with all these trade-offs, the creators of, of OAuth 2.0 decided it's no longer a protocol because it's so loose and so imprecise that it cannot be considered a protocol. And they said it's a framework. So the specification now says it's, it's a framework. It's not a protocol. Bad thing about it is that you can put this nice logo on your website, say I am completely OAuth 2 compliant, and still have your security implemented badly or completely broken. Because there are parts of, the product of this protocol which are critical to the security of, of your system and they are completely unspecified. Yeah, well, luckily there are open source implementations on the market which hopefully get the implementation well. Uh, yeah, before I go to the details of the protocol, another issue about it is that because the specification is so loose, <coughs> implementations are not interoperable. It, it, the spec itself says this is likely to produce many non-interoperable implementations, meaning that if you choose a single vendor for your OAuth 2.0 infrastructure, you are going to stick to that vendor because you cannot deploy part of it implemented with Spring Framework, for example, and another part with, with whatever vendor there is. Yeah, but since it is on the market, it is one of the most widely deployed yeah, frameworks, not protocols, we should care. Because why? Because it definitely helps us to build publicly available APIs. Consider the case if you want to expose your API to the public and you say, I'm not going to use OAuth 2.0 because it's insecure, then you have two problems. You have to either build a secure protocol yourself, which is quite an effort and I doubt worth doing it. Second problem, people are not going to use your API because it will require them to learn a new protocol. So still OAuth is like the only option we have. In, in, in cases when we have clients like mobile phones and, and JavaScript clients and, and so on and so forth. So this is the general idea of the high level idea of the, the framework. It says the following, the, the resource owner, the, oftentimes this is the actual user, but it can be a, an application, but most of the times it's a user, has his user credentials. There are clients, clients can be mobile applications or server side applications. There, are, there is an authorization server, which is the entity responsible for giving access to some resources or not giving the access. And there are resource servers. Those are the ones where secure, the protected resources are stored. So you may have these, these parts of, for example, you may have a client which is built by a third party vendor or by a completely unknown people if your API is public. Yet your user has to go through this client and have access to the protected resources on the server. A good example would be application which is capable of posting something on Facebook on your behalf. I, you don't want to share your Facebook login and password with some application built by a person who, is, who has nothing to do with Facebook. Neither Facebook wants them to do that because if that application is compromised or if it's built with the purpose of collecting user credentials, then bad things happen. Moreover, users oftentimes have the same, like how many of you have same passwords for many accounts, like email, Facebook, just like, just most of us. So if you share your, your credentials with one application and that application is compromised, all of your accounts are, are open to the, to the hackers. So the goal of, of this protocol was to make sure that user credentials, username and password are never shared with with the clients and, and parties that should not have access to them. The way it is implemented is by having tokens. So the idea is the following. Re user goes to the client and says he wants to access a protected resource on this server. The client will then redirect the user to authorization server somehow. The, the spec is only meant to be used with HTTP protocol. So redirects are an essential part of, of HTTP and that's where many things are done by, by the OAuth. 
So yeah, the user is redirected to authorization server, and then he will log in on the authorization server. So this is the only entity which knows the username and password. Then the authorization server will somehow, again depending on the case, issue an access token. That access token is received by the client and then used to have access to a resource server. So once the token is issued, the, the client can, can perform any actions on behalf of the user and still without, without having access to his credentials. Another benefit of using the token is that the token can have narrow scope. You can say, I issue this token to my mobile client, but that client has a read-only access to my data. It cannot modify anything. Uh, yeah, so this is the high-level picture. There are concrete cases of obtaining the token from authorisa authorization server. They, are, they depend on uh, your use case. Some of them are more secure. Like there is one secure case for which the spec was originally built. That's when, when your client is actually a server, when this is a server server-side application. Then OAuth 2 is like is considered secure. Why? Because this was the original use case. Others were added on top of it by the, the companies who who wanted to make it suitable for them. So let's see what are the flows. There are four flows defined by the protocol. Uh, The first one and, and the most secure is the authorization code flow. This is intended to be used by server-side clients. Yeah, the picture is from the protocol spec, might not be perfect, but <coughs> I'll try to explain. So here what happens is that the resource owner, via a user agent, which is a browser, wants to get access to protected resources. The client will redirect if the user is not, not logged in, the client will redirect the user to the authorization server. The authorization server will present the user with, an, with a login page where the user inputs his credentials and then the authorization server returns to the, redirects the user back to the client, but it includes in, in the redirect URL an authorization code, which is a code, code to obtain the access token. That code can be used only once so the code is then sent by the client. This is the, the communication between two servers. The, by the client, it is sent to the authorization server. And the authorization server send, sends back an access token. And optionally, a refresh token as well. I'll talk about that in just a minute. So here, in this case, the access token, which actually allows the client to perform any actions on behalf of the user, is not shared either with the user agent, which is the browser, not even with the resource owner himself. This is more secure because there are less chances that the resource owner will use the token somehow, lose the token somehow. I mean, if, if you give tokens to your users, they are li likely to, to misuse them, misplace them, and, and get hacked. Problem of this spec is that communication between those two parties is completely unspecified. Like the authorization server and client are supposed to communicate, but the spec says nothing about how. So, although normally you should implement this via a secure channel, if the spec doesn't require that, then you can put whatever you want here and, and still be OS2 compliant. Uh, yeah, another thing which is, I guess, not mentioned in the spec, there, are, there is an additional type of token which is a refresh token. Oh, let's see, let's go to the... Yeah, so use cases for the previous flow is when your client is a server and when, the funny thing, the spec says you should use this use case when security of the token is your concern. But this is funny because security of the token should always be your concern, otherwise the whole point of the protocol is lost. Yeah, so once in the previous scenario, when, when the client is a server, you issue an access token which is which expires after a day let's say so why is that for again this is for additional security layer like you may have a single client and you may have many resource servers like for example you have a a server client which generates reports for your organization and it has access to many resource servers one of them will be 
your information about your employees, another will be your accounting information, and so on and so forth. And the access token may be valid for all these resource servers. So in the case, if one of the resource servers is compromised, those can as well be, be built by third parties. If one of them is compromised, means all your resource servers will be compromised if, there is, if the token lives forever. That's why the token expires after like, it usually they recommend after one day. You may set this value to whatever suits your, your requirements better. But if, if the token expires once per day, you have to ask your users to log in every day, or, or uh, depending on how often the token expires. That's not the perfect user experience, I would say. So what the spec did, they, they introduced a refresh token. It's, it's an optional addition to the protocol, which says that authorization server may return access token and refresh token to the client, and the refresh token is never shared with resource servers. So it's only kept on the client, and the authorization server, of course, knows about it. And in, in case when the access token, which lives only one day, expires, then the client can grab the refresh token and obtain a new access token from the server for, for the next day. Uh, yeah, key, one, one of the important things here is that clients, they also authenticate with the server. Not, not the, the resource owners, not the real users, but clients, which are applications, they also have to authenticate with the server. Meaning that if an, an access to obtain the token comes from a client which is not registered here, it won't pass. For that, clients have client ID and client secret. This is basically, you can, you can call it a username and password, but for, for an application. And it's very important not to store them in the same location as you store the refresh tokens. Because normally, authorization server will, will keep all the tokens in one place, and his configuration in, may be in the same place. The spec, I guess the spec does not mention it, but if you store your, your client IDs and client secrets in the same database as you store your refresh tokens, if that database is compromised, the, the attackers will be able to obtain access tokens indefinitely because they, they can pretend to be one of the clients which you have registered. So yeah, it's an important note. And this is again one of the, the reasons why OAuth2 is often blamed because you can implement it in in, in like way which is compliant with the spec but still make this, this completely non-obvious mistake and get it wrong. Another type, are there any questions so far, by the way? If anyone has questions, please interrupt me. Yeah. Sorry, just a previous slide. Sure. Um, how, how does a compromised resource server protect from, um, like why does the ref not knowing the refresh token matter when the resource server obviously has to just be the one that determines whether the access token is valid or not. Because if it's invalid, kind of just <laughs> maliciously say it's invalid refresh and then it gets a new, a, a new access token as a result of that anyway. Do you understand my question? Yes, yes, I totally, uh, it's a good point. Uh, because the, the token itself contains the information about its validity date. And the client can validate that. And if the client sees that the token is still valid, yeah. and there is a server which says it's ha it has expired, that's something you should probably look into. But yeah, it's, it's, the protocol says nothing about this case. Uh, yeah, but the, the client should, should verify the... Normally, actually, the client itself validates the validity of the access token before making the request to the resource server. And if it's expired, then the client goes here and, and obtains the new, the new token. But the yeah, well, I guess my point is is that like you could sort of be a man in the middle if you own the resource server because you could just force the client to give me a new token whenever I wanted to, and then I could use that token elsewhere, right? Yeah, you're correct. You can. So if, if the client th does not check the validity of, of the token, yeah. that attack would work. I guess, I guess the spec says that the client should check the, the expiration of the token, but it's not enforced to do so. 
Did I answer? Yeah. Okay. Uh, the uh, next flow which is described by the spec is implicit. Implicit is because in this case the client will obtain the token. This is meant for to be used by, by browser clients. If, if your applications run purely in the browser, there is no server side, there is no way you can store your tokens securely, then implicit grant is something that you should use. So this works similar to the previous use case. You, your user goes to a client, the client redirects the user to the authorization server. The server, if the user logs in, provides a redirect URI, and the access token is included in that URI. And then the user agent, which is the browser, has to cut off the, the, the access token from the URI. Yeah, the, the, it's a funny thing. The spec says that the script which receives this, this redirection and, and removes the token from the URI, the, it must be the first script loaded by the page. And if the, because if there is another script which loads faster, then it can, can grab the token. And this is again a very tiny detail which is easily missed. Like if you have a web page which, and, and the script should be on top of it, likely in, in a year, somebody will just forget, put more scripts on top, more scripts on top, and it will end up somewhere in the middle. And if then one of, of, of the scripts which is loaded wants to steal the token, it can do that. Another bad thing is that in this case, access tokens are stored in the browser history. So if somebody has access to the machine, they can, they can steal the tokens. Uh, yeah, so that's why this, this use case is pseudo, it's recommended to be used when I the application only requires temporary access to the data. So uh, if the token will expire in like one hour, this is considered to be a, a good use case. Because if the user opens his application and, and, and sits at his desk, it's less likely that someone will steal the token from his browser history. Yeah, it's for the browser clients, and the spec says that you should trust the browser if you implement this flow. Honestly, I don't understand how you can trust the browser a lot, but they, they say you should. Uh, the next use case, it, it gets simpler and it gets worse. This is the case when, when the resource owner will actually share, well, the user will share his credentials with the client. So this is intended to be used by, for, for mobile phones when a, a mobile application needs to act on, on behalf of a user. Usually what happens is the user types his username and password into the app. The app then goes to the authorization server and exchanges those credentials to the access token. From there on, it will only use the access token to access any protected resources. Although, in this case, user credentials are actually shared with the client, the spec recommends that this flow will be implemented only for strongly trusted clients. So if you have your API and you are the one who's building the client, you can use the flow. Otherwise, it's, it's not recommended. Problems with this approach is that your users are getting used to type their username and password into native mobile applications. And so they do not know if it's an application which is developed by you or by a third party vendor. And if they are used to type, type their, their credentials, they will eventually do so on applications which are not developed by you. So that's a risk, but the, normally the flow should be implemented only for, for the clients that are built by, by yourself. In this case, the client will not even store user credentials. He will just pass them to the server and obtain the token and work with the token from, from there on. Yeah, an, an alternative here, by the way, would be if, if you have, for example, a server where you can run part of your application, you could employ the first flow, which is authorization code flow that I've shown in the beginning. But then it, it would require showing a, a web form inside your native mob mobile application, 
which, is, which harms user experience. That's why this flow was introduced. So the use cases are, yes, again, strongly trusted mobile clients, yeah, mobile apps, basically. Next one is even more simple and probably even less secure. This is when uh, the client, whatever there is, actually has access to the credentials. This is intended to be used by applications which are acting on behalf of their own, not on behalf of a user. So for example, if you have your Google Drive and you are storing pictures on it, and you want some application to like, go there once per day and check what you have added and then maybe post that to, to your blog, then this application has to, to, to have, or, yeah, that, that's a bad example. If, for example, if a bunch of users have a shared directory somewhere on the server, the, the application should not act on behalf of a single user, but should act on behalf of its own. In these cases, this, this app will have its own username and password, will exchange them for the access token, and use the access token from there on. You may say, then, how is this any secure at all if, if credentials are stored here? Yeah, again, this should be implemented by the applications that you trust, first. Second, once the access token is obtained by, by this client, it, from there on, the application will only use the access token instead of using the credentials. So this is an additional level of, of security. Use cases, yeah, the use case was sad. So those are the four flows. Which one you pick depends on your needs or the trust in browsers. Uh, the token. Now, what spec itself says little about the token. Token is usually a string like this. It can be randomly generated. Must the, the spec only says that it must be generated in such a way that there is no way to, to guess it. All the rest is up to the implementer. Usually the token looks like this. This is an example, I guess, from Spring Framework. It says the token type. This is a required field, which may be whatever, whatever the implementer was. Expires in. This is, again, the, the, the field which says when the token will expire. It, it's to be checked. And the optional refresh token, which we have seen before. The problem with this is the token has absolutely no information about who the user is. Like, imagine, imagine a normal use case. You, you receive, you are a resource server, and you receive a request to generate a report for the user who has presented you a token. <coughs> you do not know who the user is, so the next step is to make a request to some entity and to ask who, who is the owner of this token. So th this, if, if such tokens are used, usually leads to, to additional requests to, to get info about the user. To solve that, there is a standard, yeah, there is a standard which is JWT, JWT or JSON Web Token. They say it should be pronounced JWT. This, another type of, another form of, of the token which consists of three parts, the header, the actual payload and, and signature, usually it is all, it, it looks like, like this when encoded, but what's inside is this. The header specifies the hashing algorithm. The payload is the information that you want to include into your token. It can be an email of the user, what, what permissions he has, and the signature. The signature usually, not usually, but the spec requires the signature to be implemented this way. This hashing algorithm hashes the base64 encoded header, encoded payload, and the secret for the client. So by, by using this, this signature, you can verify then that the token was released by the, the entity who says it released the, the token. So yeah, this, like, this was all about the, the authorization done via the OAuth protocol. But one of the use cases, normally, if, if you want to use OAuth, is because you have many clients acting with your API. And if, you have, if your user needs to use multiple clients at the same time, they will have to log in to each of the clients, which is certainly a bad user experience. 
especially if you have many, many web applications and user works with all of them, logging in every time is bad. That's why SSO fits really well into this use case, but it's not specified by the OAuth spec. Again, one more thing which gives a way to, to make profit for companies who build commercial products on top of OAuth. They, they build an SSO support into it and they say, like, pay us money. Easy way to implement SSO, there are, like, you can probably invent your own, but the easy way to implement the SSO is to have a session on the authorization server. We will see that on a demo. So if, if the user logs in on the authorization server and goes to one of, of your clients, of the client applications, then when he wants to use another client application, he is again redirected to the authorization server, but he's already logged in there, and he'll be immediately redirected to the client application with the, the uh, authorization code, which is not perfect for the user because he sees all these redirects, but still he is not required to type his, his login multiple times. What about the implementations? There are open source implementations on the market, freely available for us. There is Cost Server, which is supported by uh, big players in the market, such as IntelliJ and Eclipse Foundation. There is Apache All2, which is an implementation of the protocol from Apache. And there is also a Spring Framework implementation, which we will see in action today. Uh, any questions? Okay. By the way, who, who is here to see a detailed instruction on how to work with Spring Security? Anyone? Yeah, at least one person. Because the, the talk description says uh, how to build that with Spring Security. I'm going to disappoint you a little bit, especially you, <laughs> because the example will really be a short one. But anyway. I'm going to show you a simple example of how you can build a OAuth2 compliant authorization server with Spring Framework. Yeah, so a demonstration. So is this okay? The font size is okay? I hope everyone can see it. So this is a Spring Boot application. Is there anyone who does not know what Spring Boot is? Okay, perfect. So th this is the, the, the Spring Boot application, the main method and some boilerplate that we can skip. Here is our configuration. So this is the, the annotation which says that this class will be our config. Uh, this is an authentication manager which is in, in our case, a boilerplate code. You can replace this authentication manager with whatever, like for example, if you want to authenticate over LDAP or other, other legacy providers that you have, you can replace the authentication manager with the suitable implementation. In our case, the default will be provided by Spring Boot, which is a, an in-memory dummy implementation which allows to authenticate a user configure is a spring boilerplate. Then what's interesting is this configuration. So here we have a client details service configure. Long names are, are the thing of Spring Framework. So clients, and we say clients in memory, which will create an in-memory storage for our tokens, meaning that all, all the tokens will be stored in memory. We say, specify the client. Uh, so client ACME and ACME and the client secret, those are the credentials which will be used by the clients to authenticate. We said auto approve to true, this is optional, but it, it simplifies the flow a little bit. 
we specify which flows we want to support. So we have seen four different uh, flows which allow us to obtain the access token. We specify just one here. We may as well specify many. But it's better to have, for example, if, you, if, if your client has access to the server, the authorization code flow, which is used by the server side, and it also has access to the, the mobile application flow, it's better to have two clients. Because if, if one of them is compromised, only, only one, one flow is, is compromised. But this, the API allows me to set as many, as many grant types here as I want. And I can also specify the scope. So remember, I said that if, if an application has access to user name and password, it has access to all of his data. Now, if we have the scope, this allows us to reduce the, the access which is given to the token. We will see that in, in just a minute. We'll see the, the token once it will be running. So with this, like a couple lines of code, we can get an OAuth 2 server running. This is, of course, not production code, but if you are developing clients on top of it, this already provides you a, a tool to work with. And yeah, the one important detail is this annotation here. Enable authorization server. A lot of things happen when you add it. A Spring Framework will add endpoints for all the actions which are performed on top of authorization server. To get the token, to exchange the authorization code for a token, to refresh the token, all the endpoints are enabled by this annotation. Whoops. So let's now run it. There you go. Started in just a couple of seconds. So what I will do now, I will perform the first step of of the flow that I've shown you, which is to obtain the authorization code. This is the, the, the first, the most secure flow of, of the protocol. Uh, whoops. So, the, can, you, can you see the, what's, what's written here? Okay. So our application is deployed on, on localhost. Meetup is our, our root context. Then OAuth is something which is added by Spring Framework. This is customizable, but I don't see reasons to change it. Then we say authorize, and we specify the response type, which is code. So we want to obtain an authorization code, which we will then exchange for a token. We also specify our client ID, and we specify the redirect URL. URI. Specifying the URI is, is important. If we specify a URI which is not registered on the server, the server will not accept this request. This is, again, an additional layer of security to make sure that the authorization server can control URLs to which the authorization codes are, are granted. Otherwise, if, if this is not validated on the server side, I can specify my own host here and, and obtain the, the authorization code. So, yeah, I'm already logged in. Need to. So the, the, the code that we had enables, by default, protects those endpoints and enables basic authentication with the user and password, I hit login, and I'm now redirected to the example website, and here's my authorization code. This code can only be used once to obtain the token. If somebody steals the code, if an attacker obtains the code and tries to obtain an access token, the, server, the only way the server can detect, detect this is when there are multiple requests to obtain an access token with the same authorization code meaning that either the client is implemented badly or, or somebody tries to attack it. In this case, the server must reject. If, if it receives two requests with the same authorization code to obtain an access token, 
he must reject the second request and also invalidate the token which was issued for the first client. Meaning that the worst that happens if this code is stolen, the user is just logged out. That's it. So we now take the code. I'll open Postman. Yeah. Now the second request we are going to make is a POST request. This was supposed. This is already on the server side, from the client server to the authorization server. So here we again our meetup application, the OAuth, which is the Spring URL, and we say token. We ask for token. We say grant type, which is authorization code. In this case, both the client ID and yeah, the client ID shouldn't be there, probably. Yeah, again, I'll redirect URI. And the code. I need to paste the code here. This request also contains authentication. The, the client ID and client secret are passed. This way, the server will know that an authorized client is, is willing to obtain an access token instead of just giving it to, to anyone. So we make a post request. Uh, yeah, send. And here's the token. So this is our randomly generated access token. This is the token type, which is bearer, meaning that it's, it's a simple string. It expires in a certain amount of time, and it says the scope demo. Now, this, this value here is it can be a set of comma separated strings. The spec says it, it's up to the implementers what to put inside the scope, but what this gives us is the ability to narrow the, the access which a, a, a token has. For example, if I want my, my mobile application to be able to like, post on, on Facebook on, on my behalf, but I don't want it to be able to add friends, then the scope may say just post. And then the, the protected resource server, when he receives the token, he can validate the scope and say, okay, if, if this token has the right scope, then he has access only to this, to, to a part of the API, not, not to the entire uh, API. So basically, that's it. Once the token is obtained, then, then it's not uh, specified, by the way, by the the protocol, how exactly this should be exchanged with the authorization server, it's up to the implementation. Uh, yeah, basically that's, that's the flow. Uh, let's try to obtain another token with the same code. We send it and it says that the grant is invalid. Okay. We go back to the presentation. So conclusions, uh, what's bad about it? A lot of things, as, as we have heard. Spec is inaccurate. I mean, security has to be, in my opinion, security has to be accurate. Otherwise, people will implement it the way they want, they will get it wrong and will not be secure. It's really easy to misuse, as you have seen. You accidentally, by not reading the spec carefully or not investigating, you store refresh tokens and, and client IDs and secrets in the same database, database is stolen, security is compromised. Somebody steals the token from browser history, same thing. Yeah, so mobile and, and, and native applications are not really the best case for auth. What's good about it? It's simple to use. Like, there are a couple of endpoints that you need to, to know about and you can, you can build OAuth client. Server is a little bit more complex, but there are open source implementations. Uh, yeah, it's, it's an industry standard. If, if you build your API and you say, I am OAuth 2 compliant, then other people can easily build clients on top of your API because there are open source libraries that, that implement the spec. And yeah, you may say, if it's so bad, why do we use it? Because 
as I said, try, try to build your own security protocol, which will support all the, all the use cases you, you may have. I think most of us would make a lot of mistakes in there, and it, it would not be more secure than, than OAuth already is, especially taking into account the, the implementations. I mean, building a, a spec is one thing, but then implementing it correctly without bugs is really difficult. And I think that, for example, Spring Framework implements it much better that, than any of, of people whose primary focus is not to implement security, but to build applications with it. That said, I'm done. Any questions? Yes. Um, so you mentioned previously that uh, the token contains a signature. Um, how is that verified? Is that verified by posting to the server, or do you have like a public key that verifies that signatures? Both cases are supported. Uh, Chart spec says that. Depending on your needs, you may deploy either the public client key verification or the token can be self-contained and, and then you can verify it on your own. You said that the uh, redirect URI has to be uh, registered on the server. Right. But then you send uh, client ID and uh, redirect, uh, redirect URI. Right. Shouldn't it be hard coded on the server side? Uh, and, I mean, yeah, yeah, true, true. It, it can. In fact, it can. It will, it will be more secure if it's yeah. only hard coded on, on the, the server side. But there are cases when a single client wants to redirect to multiple okay. servers. Then it has to specify. Okay. And the spec is pretty accurate in that, in that uh, point. For example, if the server may only hard code the part of the URI and, and allow the clients to specify the uh, rest of it. Uh, what else? Yeah, I guess that's it. Yes? Uh, is it possible to include the uh, uh, JOT uh, and the uh, access token uh, for, um, using Spring? Yes. In fact, we did. We did implement an authorization server, and this was exactly how we how we implemented it. I guess there is there is even a, a library which allows to do that in, in Spring. Like Spring, Spring itself has support for for Jot. How secure is Jot actually? Uh, what do you mean? How secure is it? I mean, if I consider doing something like this, um, and I explain to someone the security side that we are going to store all of this information on the client side so that we are kind of panicking. Uh, well, it, 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 it's a bad idea. <laughs> Maybe. Then, well, then you have to make an additional server-side call. If, if you do not trust the, the exposing your information in the token, then you should not expose it and make an additional server-side call, call to, to fetch the information about the user. But it depends on what is inside the token. Sometimes only an email is sufficient, or a couple of, of words about the user which are not really critical, then you can safely store them in, in the token. But yeah, if, if, if there is a concern that if the token is, is stolen, better not to, to store the information there. Uh, is the of the only proven solution for single sign on, or there are other solutions? Of course, of course there are others. There is SAML. Yeah, yeah, true. There, there is there is SAML, and SAML was in place years before OAuth. Again, it was suited for server-side SSO implementations. The primary goal of, of SAML was to to allow SSO, whereas OAuth, it's not an SSO protocol, it's just a, an authorization protocol, but you can build SSO on top of it easily. The problem with SAML, it's much more complex. The tokens are huge XML files, whereas all well, tokens are just tiny, tiny bits of, of JSON. And yeah, OAuth, with all the trade-offs that we have seen, OAuth still provides use cases for mobile clients for mobile phones or for browser clients. SAML, it's difficult. I, I don't think it does.
Anyone else? Okay. Then thank you very much. Thank you. We